As you may recall, the year 2010 was the first year, it was the tipping point, the year in which, for the first time, it was recorded that more than 50% of the world's 7 billion population were living in cities, not in rural areas. By 2014, that number had arisen to 54% across the globe in cities, and more than 78% of the developed world, the industrialized world population, are residing in cities. Currently, 3.9 billion people, or 55% of global population, are in cities, and the number is expected to grow to 6.4 billion by 2050, in other words, 67% of the world's population. It's estimated that 3 million people around the world are moving to cities every week. That is a UN Habitat uh, statistic. As Benjamin Barber observes in his very interesting book, If Mayors Rule the World, quote, As it was our origin, the city now appears to be our destiny. It is where creativity is unleashed, community solidified, and citizenship realized. But this year's international dialogue on migration is not about urbanization. It is about the nexus between migrants and cities. What are the pressures? that migrants bring to bear upon cities, and what opportunities, uh, what pr pressures do cities bring to bear on migrants, what opportunities do migrants bring to cities, and what opportunities do cities offer to migrants. So that is the focus of our time here. Now based on my own participation in two large mayor's conferences, one in Barcelona and one in Amsterdam the last two years, and my talks with mayors in various places around the world, from Guangzhou to St. Petersburg and from Kinshasa to Kuwait, I can tell you my conclusion is mayors get it. Mayors understand, probably more than national politicians and parliamentarians, they understand migrants. This is where reality comes face to face with policy. <laughs> Mayors understand they have, they're closer to ground reality than most other officials. And that's perhaps for one simple reason. It is the mayors and the local authorities who have to provide the basic needs of migrants, shelter, jobs, security, and public services. Mayors also have to manage the process of migrant integration into the local society and economy. So we are hoping to draw, in these two days, to draw on the wisdom of mayors, local authorities, ministers of interior, and others uh, to help us to understand and identify the best practices uh, the lessons learned and to build bridges between good practices and policies at local and national levels. In the past 65 years, the International Organization for Migration has co constantly invited and engaged local authorities through projects and conferences. This is the first time, however, that we are dedicating our global forum to cities and migration. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that tomorrow we shall be launching the latest edition of IOM's uh, flagship publication, the World Migration Report, edition 2015, and we have deliberately focused it on the same subject, migrants and cities. Now let me make qu uh, quickly three points. First one is the impact of cities on migrants. And that is that migrants, sorry, the second point, the impact of migrants on cities. And the third interesting point, the impact of you, the policymakers, on both migrants and the cities that you lead. 
So the first point on impact of cities on migrants is that migration is driving much of urban growth these days, making the cities much more diverse, much more dynamic places in which to live. Nearly one in five of the world's 245 million international migrants now live in the world's top 20 largest cities. In many of these same cities, for example, Sydney, London, New York, for example, migrants account for more than a third of the population. In other cities, such as Amsterdam, Brussels, and Dubai, migrants can account for as much as half the population. In still other cities, the growth in migration has also been remarkable. For example, the number of foreign residents in Seoul, Korea has doubled in the last 10 years. We are, for demographic and other reasons, conflicts and so forth, we are inexorably becoming more multi-ethnic, more multicultural, more multi-religious. And if we are not educating, informing, and raising the awareness of our people about this growing phenomenon, then we're probably not doing our job. The reasons all of these, and indeed most cities, are attracting a large number of people is very clear. Cities offer the most generous employment opportunities. Cities offer convenient access to essential services, such as transport, health, and education. Cities contribute investment, knowledge, and technologies. And fourth, often the most overlooked, newcomers can really connect with social support networks consisting of family, friends, or persons sharing a similar ethnic or linguistic background. I asked myself when I was several years ago in Minnesota, why would Somalians from one of the nicest climates, a very warm climate, why would they come to one of the coldest climates in the world in Minnesota? Well, the answer is very clear. A few Somalis went there initially, and that became a magnet. <laughs> so they end up in a cold climate, having come from a very warm one. So the point I'm trying to underline is that it's primarily in urban environments that the success or the failure of integration is most important. There are very few migrants, even those from the most isolated rural areas, who don't end up in city because that is where it's happening. Cities are the places where the overwhelming majority of migrants come into contact with their new host country. It's a local reality. We think of migrants as moving from one country to another. In fact, they're probably moving from one locale to another locale. So it's not an intellectual or isolated uh, abstract concept, uh, integration, it can, it, that you can reduce it to fulfillment of some administrative requirements, even though they're important. It is a process that is felt, it is breathed, and it is lived in an immediate and personal way. Therefore, important that local governments develop social inclusion policies that help provide better living conditions, that includes migrants in local development plans, plans that take into account the interests both of migrants and the cities, the communities. Second point, the impact of, of migrants on, on cities. Migrants have an undeniable impact on the cities into which they move. But all too often, the focus is on the negative stereotypes, the misleading mythology that would lead you to believe that migrants bring with them social disruption, excessive claims on social welfare, or competition for jobs, or worse still, that migrants may be bringing in disease, a criminal element, or there might even be terrorists among them. It's very difficult in this period to convince people after the post 9-11, uh, what I call this, the, the security syndrome. So all of this can lead to discrimination or even to xenophobia, especially at present when anti-migrant sentiment is rampant and growing pretty much throughout the world. In reality, the picture is different. Historically, migration 
has been overwhelmingly positive. We have built our societies in part on the backs of migrants and with the brains and talent of migrants. That will continue to be the case for a long time to come. They're contributing as much as they are receiving. In fact, they probably pay more in taxes than the services they receive. And I, it's not just in terms of remittances. I wouldn't make light of remittances. That's $435 billion a year, more than foreign aid and equal to all direct investment. But it's not the whole story. Let me highlight a couple of areas. Migrants are builders of resilience. When a conflict or a disaster occurs, migrants are the most resilient force in the economy. I remember them sending money back when a number of Ethiopians were expelled and sent home. Hundreds of thousands of dollars came from the diaspora to help them. Migrants are also <clears throat> agents of local development. They play a central role in, in forging links between the country of destination and the country of origin. City to city links are often created. Migrants and diaspora communities play an important role in supporting local decentralized development partnerships. Migrants also are city makers. They're not just consumers of services, they're resourceful, they're creative, they're inventive. They bring with them new ideas, new motivation, new impulses, and creative approaches. They can help strengthen the place of cities in the global economic and political hierarchy. Now the UN itself, and here we are in the Palais des Nations in, in Geneva, the United Nations itself has come over, year, over the years to begin to recognize in a more official way the important role that migrants play in national and global uh, development agendas. This is manifest in recent developments. In 2007, the UN created the Global, uh, the, 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 uh, global Forum on Migration and Development, which has just met for the eighth time in Istanbul about 10 days ago. At that time, Secretary General Kofi Annan appointed a special representative of the Secretary General for Migration and Development. The discussions that have just concluded in September in New York agreed to the Sustainable Development Goals, which will guide our efforts until the year 2030, and it includes for the first time reference to migration in four of the 17 uh, targets of these goals. And as recently as, as last month, then, uh, that has put migration onto the agenda firmly of the UN. My third and final point, what is the impact of all of us, all of you I should say, as policy makers on migrants and cities? How do we construct the right policy framework? Uh, I think all cities uh, in broad terms are going after several goals. One is to boost productivity by lowering poverty and increasing employment. Cities are trying to promote inclusiveness by facilitating residents across uh, access to employment, housing, education, health, social welfare, public transportation, and thirdly, to foster sustainability through flexible long-term urban planning. Now, all of these will be objectives will be facilitated if we include a migration dimension into the planning. So you have three, three powers, it seems to me, that are extremely critical to the, a social inclusive policy. Number one is the power of policy making itself. You have the power to protect migrants through a rights-based approach by putting migrants at the center of your policies, paying particular attention to the most vulnerable and it's almost always women and children, ensuring that migrants are included in local action plans, decriminalizing irregular migrants, turning detention centers into reception centers, implementing <clears throat> anti-trafficking laws to protect migrants, 
supporting policies that help migrants integrate smoothly, in helping to galvanize a comprehensive approach to migration policy making. Second sub point under point three is the power of the purse. It takes money to do these things. Integration is not without cost because it involves very often cultural orientation. It may involve language training. It may involve other facilitative measures to make integration uh, a smooth process. Second sub point, employment and skills recognition. A diverse population provides a competitive advantage for all countries in particular regard to small to medium enterprises and those seeking to compete internationally. Access to public services. The general view is <coughs> that migrants come to your country because they want to take advantage of your free public services. Well, ask ourselves a couple of questions. Do we want unhealthy migrants in our communities, which makes unhealthy communities? Or is it not in our public interest, our, our own uh, city and national interest, to make sure that migrants have access to health facilities so they will be healthy? Do we want uneducated migrant children in our neighborhoods? Or we would like to give them access to the schools so they can eventually also contribute? So there's several ways to look at this, and I think the latter is the better way to give them access. And then finally, you have the power of pronouncement, the public statements you make. People take their lead from what public officials say. They set the tone for your citizens. You thus play a very significant role in changing what is currently a very poisonous, a very toxic public discourse about migration. Most of the news that you read today about migration is negative. That needs to change. And it's public officials who can help change that. The power of your public pronouncements can counter the widespread but false and damaging stereotypes of migrants and misleading mythology around in the public debate. So we have to do something about this growing and widespread anti-migrant sentiment that's un unnecessarily endangering the lives of migrants while ignoring the potential they have to contribute positively. In conclusion, you wouldn't know it by the length of my remarks, but we, we are absolutely thrilled that you're all here. It's a great honor to have you here. We're looking forward, uh, we're a little bit selfish in a sense because we think we're going to profit from what you're going to teach us. We really want to learn from you how you're handling the challenge and the opportunity of migration into your cities. We believe, and I have no doubt, that the outcomes of this conference are going to contribute to better policy making and practice in all regions of the world. We will be publishing a volume after this, as we did after the Diaspora Conference. It's a volume that should be available to you within a couple of months. We hope that that will bring in a still wider audience to talk about this phenomenon. Migration is not going away. It is inevitable because of the demography and other driving forces. It's necessary if the industrialized societies uh, and the societies in the global south are going to have functioning economies. And it's entirely desirable if we go about it in the right manner. So the weight of office falls squarely on your shoulders for the well-being of all those within your cities or locales. And as Benjamin Barber once again says, given the state's, the state's resistance to cross-border collaboration, our foremost political challenge today is to discover alternative institutions, namely city councils and mayors, capable of addressing the multiple challenges of an interdependent world. The role of cities, therefore, cannot be overemphasized. The city's role is primordial because even as countries and international agencies develop and formulate uh, broad-based encompassing development goals, in the words of New York's Michael Bloomberg, quote, it is mayors 
who still have to deal with the real world. Thank you. Let me now turn uh, to our speakers. Let me introduce our keynote speakers. I have the pleasure first of introducing uh, the Honorable Mayor of Geneva, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Esther Alder, uh, and on my left, uh, Dr. Aisa Kirabo uh, Casillera, who's an old friend of ours, a young old friend of ours, the Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of UN Habitat. And at my far left is Ms. Maria uh, Sigan, as Director of Strategy and General Affairs Directorate in the uh, uh, European Commissioner for Home Affairs. Uh, and so let me give the floor, first of all, to Ms. Adler to deliver her keynote, keynote remarks. Let me just say that she has been the mayor of Geneva since June 2015, uh, elected on, uh, on behalf of the Green Party. She was a municipal councillor in Geneva, 1995 to 1997, becoming a member of the Great Council of Geneva from 1997 to 2009. And in 2010, she was appointed by the Federal Office of Justice as an expert at the National Commission on Prevention of Torture. I welcome Madam Mayor at this important event, I invite her to deliver her welcome remarks. Thank you very much. Monsieur le Directeur Général de l'Organisation Internationale pour les Migrations, Mesdames et Messieurs les Ministres, Mesdames et Messieurs, je suis très heureuse d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui et de vous transmettre les salutations de la ville de Genève. Il y a une cohérence certaine entre le thème des migrants et des villes et la ville de Genève. Depuis l'époque romaine, Genève est un point de passage, un carrefour. Et depuis le XVIe siècle, Genève est une ville d'immigration. Dès 1550, les réformés français et italiens qui étaient victimes de persécutions ont trouvé refuge à Genève. Grâce à leurs relations avec les milieux d'affaires étrangers, ils ont relancé l'économie, développé l'imprimerie et contribué à l'essor industriel. La révocation de l'édit de Nantes en 1685 par Louis XIV a entraîné une seconde vague de réfugiés, principalement huguenots. Au XIXe et XXe siècle, Genève a perpétué cette tradition d'accueil en recevant de nombreux exilés politiques. Les migrants, les étrangers, les réfugiés ont toujours contribué à la richesse et au développement intellectuel de Genève. Aujourd'hui, notre ville compte en tout 200 000 habitants, dont 49 d'étrangers. Avec des ressortissants de près de 190 nationalités, elle est plus cosmopolite et multiculturelle que jamais. Chaque année, 20 000 nouvelles personnes s'établissent sur le territoire municipal, soit environ 10 de la population totale de notre cité. Et dans le même temps, un nombre pratiquement équivalent d'habitants la quitte. Et donc, chaque année, la population se renouvelle. En termes d'emploi, plus de 28 000 personnes travaillent pour les organisations internationales, missions permanentes et ONG présentes à Genève. Genève est donc un véritable laboratoire de diversité. Et cette diversité est au cœur de l'identité de Genève. Elle est au cœur du fameux « Esprit de Genève », si bien décrit par Robert de Tra dans un livre publié en 1929. Permettez-moi de le citer. « Cité d'immigration et de refuge, résumé des nations, Genève doit, au dehors, la plupart de ses qualités, mais elle les refond et les frappe à son image. » Son génie consiste à enrôler les hommes qui lui arrivent d'ailleurs pour en faire des hommes d'ici, à fabriquer des patriotes avec des exilés, des évadés, des inconnus, des inquiets. 
Robert de Tra dit encore de Genève que c'est une ville où nul homme n'est étranger. Je pense que c'est toujours vrai aujourd'hui, même s'il y a parfois des réactions de repli et de tension. La ville de Genève, mesdames et messieurs, a mis en œuvre une politique publique transversale pour mieux faire face à la diversité et en faire un atout ainsi qu'une force. La politique municipale en matière de diversité se traduit en actes et euh, s'inspire de la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme. Ainsi, la ville de Genève traite les habitants du territoire municipal de manière égale, sans distinction liée à la durée de résidence, la religion, la nationalité, l'origine ethnique, le genre ou l'orientation sexuelle. Fondée sur le principe d'inclusion sociale, la politique communale en matière de diversité se focalise sur ce qui rassemble les personnes et non sur ce qui les divise. Elle reconnaît les ressources et le dynamisme des communautés linguistiques, ethniques et nationales, tout en élaborant une identité autour de valeurs communes, celles des droits humains. La volonté politique du Conseil administratif est d'œuvrer en faveur d'une Genève à la fois plurielle et une. Le Conseil administratif a défini six stratégies pour maintenir la cohésion sociale et valoriser la diversité. Je ne vais pas toutes les évoquer, mais j'aimerais mettre l'accent sur trois d'entre eux qui me paraissent importants. La ville de Genève mène une politique d'accessibilité aux prestations publiques en essayant d'atténuer les obstacles administratifs et linguistiques que peuvent rencontrer les résidents. Nous avons donc créé fin 2013 et début 2015 quatre guichets d'information généralistes que nous avons appelés les points infoservices. Les habitants bénéficiaient ainsi près de chez eux d'un accueil, d'une information sociale, d'un accompagnement et d'un appui de qualité, quelle que soit la nature de leur demande. Dans ces points infoservices, nous allons lancer à la fin de cette année des permanences multilingues, bimensuelles, en collaboration avec plusieurs associations. Durant ces permanences, il y aura la possibilité d'avoir recours à une médiation interculturelle et une information en langue étrangère. C'est un projet unique en Suisse à l'heure actuelle. Toujours dans la perspective de faciliter l'accès aux prestations municipales, nous avons par exemple envoyé fin août 14 000 lettres rédigées en 10 langues aux potentiels bénéficiaires d'allocations de rentrée scolaire que nous distribuons à des familles qui remplissent les critères précis. Les services municipaux ont organisé une dizaine de rencontres avec des représentants des communautés migrantes afin de convenir d'un langage accessible pour leur communication écrite et leur contact avec l'administration. Ces rencontres ont débouché sur l'adaptation et la traduction en six langues d'une trentaine de documents. Un deuxième axe stratégique consiste à encourager la participation politique, citoyenne et associative. La politique communale veut renforcer par ce biais le sentiment d'appartenance au lieu de vie, de même que les interactions entre les résidents du territoire municipal. Dans ce but, la ville de Genève organise depuis 2009 des contrats de quartier. Ces contrats de quartier sont des processus participatifs auxquels collaborent les autorités municipales, d'une part, et les habitants et les commerçants d'un quartier d'autre part. Les habitants sont invités à formuler des projets concrets d'amélioration de leur quartier qui sont ensuite validés par l'exécutif de la ville. Ces contrats de quartier ont notamment permis de résoudre des problèmes de nuisance sonore, de réaménager des espaces publics, ou de créer des secteurs de, à priorité piétonne. Enfin, le troisième axe que je souhaite mentionner, c'est la lutte contre les discriminations. La ville de Genève mène une politique active de lutte contre les idées reçues, les stéréotypes et les discriminations de toute forme. Pour ce faire, elle s'associe notamment à la semaine contre le racisme qui a lieu chaque année. Vous vous demandez certainement si tous ces programmes seront encore pertinents à l'avenir, car vous savez que le peuple et les cantons suisses ont voté en 2014 
une initiative contre l'immigration de masse. Conscient de l'importance de l'apport des étrangers, sachez que le canton de Genève a sagement refusé cette initiative. Il est actuellement difficile de se prononcer sur la mise en œuvre de cette initiative car les modalités de son application posent des problèmes extrêmement complexes. De plus, une nouvelle initiative pour sortir de cette impasse a recueilli 100 000 signatures nécessaires et nous allons probablement devoir revoter sur cette question. Donc je ne vais pas m'attarder là-dessus. Mesdames et messieurs, la pression migratoire a considérablement augmenté ces dernières années. Les chiffres des migrations internationales ont explosé, en particulier depuis 2013. Cette situation met toute la communauté internationale face à de nouveaux défis. Les visages de la migration sont nombreux, mais celui que nous voyons actuellement est triste et inquiétant. Des centaines de milliers de personnes fuient les persécutions et la guerre dans leur pays et viennent ref chercher refuge en Europe. Dans le courant de cette année, ils sont nombreux à avoir trouvé la mort au cours d'un voyage éprouvant. Ceux qui parviennent à entrer en Europe se retrouvent souvent devant une porte fermée. Mais il est illusoire de vouloir freiner ce flux de migrants. La pauvreté, la guerre et le dérèglement climatique pousseront toujours davantage de personnes à quitter leur pays. Et les villes devront impérativement relever le défi de l'inclusion de ces migrants et veiller à éviter leur marginalisation. D'autre part, il est urgent que la gouvernance internationale repense l'aide au développement et parvienne à s'entendre pour lutter contre le réchauffement climatique. Je suis certaine que vos réflexions durant cette conférence permettront de trouver des solutions à ces problèmes. Je vous remercie pour votre attention et je vous souhaite une bonne conférence. This is the way it should always be. <laughs> let, me, uh, uh, let me give the floor now to Dr. Kirabo to deliver her keynote remarks. Uh, before joining you in Habitat at the end of 2011, and I think that's where we first came in contact, Dr. Kirabo was the uh, governor of the Eastern Province in Rwanda, which is Rwanda's largest province with a population of two and a half million. Uh, Previously, she was also mayor of Kigali from 2006 to 2011, so we're happy to have another mayor in our midst. One of the fastest urbanizing cities in the world, Kigali. Uh, under her leadership, uh, Kigali won the UN Habitat Scroll of Honor Award in 2008 in recognition of the high level of cleanliness, greenness, safety, and sustainable affording housing, uh, affordable housing initiatives. So, uh, Dr. Kirbo, I welcome you this important dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My colleague and friend, Ambassador William Swing, Your Worship, Mayor Esther Alder, thank you for hosting me. This is my second time in the last two weeks in Geneva. Uh, distinguished participants, colleagues from the UN family, mayors who are with us here, leaders of governments, representatives from different institutions. Good morning to you all. It is a great honor for me to be back in, in Geneva. I was here last week to engage with different leaders on the preparatory process of the World Humanitarian Summit. And I think the two days we spent here, I did learn a lot. But I also kept on asking myself, what a huge opportunity we have and challenge as leaders to define the course towards sustainable development amidst the increasing challenges of human conflict, the increasing challenges of climate change, the increasing challenges of 
governance, and yet I find some kind of solace in the commitment and passion I see from the various levels of leadership across the globe. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Ambassador Swing, with your team for organizing this timely conference and for inviting UN Habitat. On behalf of UN Habitat and our Executive Director, Dr. Ewan Kloss, I would like, first of all, to recognize the essence of the existence of cities as having mostly come from the migration of the human race. And yet I think today there is a difference that we must all accept. That the pace and the scale is simply too high, much more than what we've ever been used to. I have been from the speeches of Ambassador Swing and Mayor Esther, they very well eloquently elaborated the opportunities that we have to benefit from migration. And I think it's humbling to come to a city like Geneva and hear the mayor say that even this city was built on the basis of migration and still values it. Because it is so serene and quiet and beautiful and that you can't imagine that below that or behind that is a migratory history. So on that note, we in UN Habitat strongly believe that beyond the challenges, there's a huge opportunity. And probably one of the most defining factors that will determine whether migration will lead to sustainable development or not is going to be much dependent upon the leadership of today. And so it is important that we know that as leaders and as human beings, we have a stake, a responsibility, and an accountability to respond to years from now. We do view in UN Habitat that the relationship between migration and urbanization shouldn't thus be seen only from the angle of challenges that migration and quick demographic growth creates with respect to infrastructure, housing, and provision of services. It should also be seen from the perspective of the immense opportunities that migration may provide if it is well managed and integrated into all levels of policy making. About a year ago, we had a conference of mayors, I remember, in Singapore, the city state that you all know. And through a dis intense discussion of what, what is the single most critical factor that determines the success of a city from one that is not performing. And at the end of the day, the mayors agreed that it's the ability of the city to attract super talent and to create an enabling environment for that talent to prosper and give its best. And we do believe that in migration is embedded talent because talent is with human beings. What determines or what influences the human being who has talent within themselves to be able to give back the best that they can or do the other, the other side, give the worst because we are capable of doing good and as human beings we are also capable of doing bad. It is really an issue largely of leadership. So that's why we believe that this irreversible, this strong wave of movement of people with good leadership, with good awareness, with an enabling environment that values the human being beyond a statistic can create what we're all looking for. Because at the end of the day, we have a common destiny and common values. We believe that in UN Habitat, I want to highlight four critical, what we consider to be critical points or issues that have to be like the founding principles in full agreement with what have been said by colleagues who spoke before me. Uh, the first one is the ability to invest, for the city to invest in integrating 
and empowering people of different backgrounds in this era of human mobility as migration touches upon every essence of a city. And for this to be achieved, for this to be achieved, cities don't live in abstract. Cities are influenced and led by governments. So we need to have good national migration and urbanization policies. We have seen a lot of linkages between cities, towns, village centers, and cross-border and regional migration. So it is important that we see the context of the national and the regional and global policy perspective. But secondly, is also the point on the capacity of the city to be able to implement these policies and even wherever possible, to be able to create their own contextualized policies to enable access to basic requirements. I think Mayor Esther really put it so plainly, the ability to proactively avail information, basic information in a language that people understand, to help them feel welcome, to help them feel that they're part and parcel of the city, that is the role of the mayor, and that is the beginning of connecting and integrating. Sometimes when we have these opportunities or resources, we tend to take them for granted. But we need to remember that the difference between a true leader and one who may be just be occupying an office is the level of connectivity between the leader and the most vulnerable in society. And that is why it's important when we talk about local government to also talk about local governance. So that the mayor has got a team behind him or her, civil society, private sector, women organizations, youth organizations. If there is one thing that kept me sober, and if there is one thing that was like a guiding compass for me, especially at the time when I was mayor of my city, was to know that I was simply an enabler. Outside there, there were people who were smarter in some areas than myself, and I needed to recognize that and build that leadership and accountability down to the smallest unit. It's much harder, especially in developing countries where systems and institutions are still young. How do you ensure that what you're talking about is reflected to the person in the informal settlement, to the person without a face who comes to the city and who is not even captured in the city statistic? How do you ensure that you cater for these people? We have to create a network and a team of people who feel for the different groups of people who are living in our society. Secondly, we believe on that note that in building the capacity and facilitating local governments, and I want to thank you very much, Ambassador Swing, for especially this time bringing them on table because they've been advocating for a place to be part and parcel of decision making rather than recipients of decisions that we sit and make and just ask them to implement them. I think it all begins from there. As you wisely put it, that we're here to learn from them and through learning, I'm sure we will engage and we will become all better leaders. But I've also learned that when I was mayor, I was able to learn from other mayors and from also governments because leadership is around knowing that it's not about you, you're not the end in yourself. So the linkage between the local government, regional and global leadership is critical and we hope that such conferences will bring mayors to the global development agenda much close. We do believe that as we forge forward towards our Habitat 3, the conference on sustainable urbanization, this will come much more stronger. Thirdly, I would like to say that, as I mentioned earlier on, we were here last week talking about conflict and disaster, and that how that scenario of migration in the middle of a crisis, whether it is man-made out of conflict or natural, is ending up being much more urban than we have ever envisaged. Many times we define it in terms of a planned camping system 
but we know that when disaster hits, people will go to cities and towns because they tend to feel a sense of safety and security much more than elsewhere. And I'm sure I don't have to repeat what we're seeing happening in the Middle East, in the Syrian crisis that is affecting not only Syria as a country, but also the neighboring countries and cities that are carrying a huge burden that we all need to support them as we also look at how best to handle the crisis as it comes to Europe and beyond. So we cannot forget against this background that the world is urban today as over half, 50% of the world population is urban. But I think what's more important is that the pace of urbanization is fastest in developing countries that don't have sufficient capacity to plan adequately for that. And therefore that actually is also leading to further migration. I'm cognizant of the fact that the discussion today is not on sustainable urbanization, and I will try my best to stick to the nexus between urbanization and migration. But we also have learned that within urbanization as a human-made phenomenon, the political factors that drive it, for it to be sustainable, have to be anchored in a science. They have to be anchored in a good understanding of what constitutes good urbanization to lead to sustainable development and inclusive growth. And sometimes we don't have the time to do so. And I think here we have an issue that I'd like to call local governments, local authorities too, especially those that come from developing countries. I do recall that when I was mayor, I wanted to hear so much about the issues of, of, of the people I was leading. But that alone wouldn't give me the answers. I had to know the basics of the science because the leading of a city to uphold the resilience that we've heard about here, to be able to build the infrastructure to enable inclusive development calls more than political passion. It needs strong strategic planning that is available. And we are delighted as UN Habitat, together with our partners, to support in that particular area. I want to draw your attention specifically for, to the area of housing. Within this, uh, against this background, as UN Habitat, we've reflected on what we've been doing for the last 40 years, because as you may be aware, our mandate is on supporting member states to avail their citizens to decent and adequate shelter for all. But we have realized that many times it's looked at as a physical infrastructure in isolation of the overall development uh, cycle. And that is how we have come to coin it now that as housing at the center. What we mean by housing at the center, it's a conceptual framework of action that aims to shift the focus from simply building houses to, holistic, to a holistic framework of housing development whereby we look at housing from a human rights-based approach to ensure inclusive housing from both a social and economic perspective and also enable uh, people to access jobs in that process, but also put it into context of enabling access to other basic requirements, especially education and health. And we do see many times that migrants, because they are not often captured in the planning of the city data and statistics, they finally get discriminated against and they don't get the, the protection that they deserve. So on that note, we really call upon all of us who are working in the area of development to ensure that we are as inclusive as possible and take note of their specific needs. Fourthly, we believe that this agenda calls for strong partnership. No one can do it all. And we have seen that with a strong, with a good partnership, with IOM, with UNESCO, with the International Center for Migration Policy Development, in various parts of the world with the European Union, in Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Jordan, Lebanon, 
Iraq and Syria, just to mention a few, we're able to do much more than what we'd have been able to do in isolation. It calls for us to have a sense of humility and to forget maybe the titles that we carry and the institutions that we represent. Because at the end of the day, we are serving people. And I often remind colleagues, when I was mayor, I didn't really care where you're coming from, you just are the UN. And I want the UN as one. That's when it makes sense to me. And that's when I can connect with the UN and connect it with the World Bank and the rest of it. But if you come in, you're jacketed, UN, uh, UN Habitat, UN, DP, UN. By the time I, I end my day, I've spent too much time and I don't know what you're talking about. So we need to see it from that perspective. So on that note, I would like to call upon you again as we forge our way forward towards the United Nations Conference on Housing and Sustainable Urban Development. We are counting on you to be with us in these discussions. The conference is to take place next year in October, but the deliberations and the engagements and the dialogues are already ongoing. And we count on, on you for your engagement and wise counsel in that process. I would like to end on this note once again, thanking you so much for hosting me, Mayor, in this beautiful city. And thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Swing, for inviting us. And yes, it's a bit of a difference from Nairobi here, but it's both beautiful, so thank you. Let me now give the floor to uh, Ms. Maria Sigan, who is currently the Director of the Strategy and General Affairs Directorate in the Directorate of General Home Affairs in the European Commission in Brussels. She was formerly Director for Immigration and in the same directorate, uh, Deputy Head of Cabinet of the European Commissioner, responsible for regional policy. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased to have uh, you with us, Ms. Sigan, because of the important role that the EU plays in IOM. It's a great partnership. They are, the EU is our most important uh, multilateral donor. And I'm proud to say that all 28 EU member states uh, are uh, members also, member states of IOM, and the EU is uh, an important IOM observer. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is an honor and pleasure for me to join you today for this very special session of this year International Dialogue on Migration. And let me start by congratulating uh, the International Organization for Migration and in particular Ambassador Swing on the choice of the topic, migration and cities. The 21st century will see major changes in the scale, shape and the characteristics of human mobility. We are all aware of the reasons for this. More people than ever will leave their homes whether permanently or temporarily, in search of protection or better life. However, it will be first at regional and local level that the impact of this migration will be felt most. Today, the cities are on the front, front line. They, you, are today major actors in the management of migration. The European Union is receiving many legal migrants who come to work or join their families. But besides it, we are currently facing unprecedented, an unprecedented influx of people escaping war and conflicts and seeking international protection. This is about people in need. In recent months, many cities all over Europe have shown great generosity. It's been impressive to see how swiftly local authorities have responded to the immediate needs of hundreds of thousands of people, providing them with food, shelter, medical care, and other social services. We have seen heartwarming images of citizens going out of their way to hand over blankets, bedding and clothing, while many have even opened their home for refugees. And mayors too have played a great role. Many have waited on 
have waited on railway platforms for refugees to arrive and visited reception centers personally to, to welcome them. By listening to people's stories and sharing words of comfort with them, Mayors have become the face of safety and solidarity for those fleeing from for horrific war and violence casualties. All of this has been most impressive and very much needed. But after this initial stage, a phase of structural integration will need to get underway. Although the European Union is strengthening its foreign affairs policy, wars and conflicts in many parts of the world are not expected to end soon. Hence, many people will be unable to return to their countries for the foreseeable future. They will need to start a new life in their new surroundings. Cities will face onerous tasks, finding more permanent housing, providing access to labor markets for new arrivals, and schooling hundreds of thousands of children. Given the scale of these challenges, it won't be business as usual, and our conference is a unique opportunity to discuss how we should tackle the tasks that lie ahead. Several conditions must be met if we are to achieve these objectives, and let me mention just a few. Some of them already appeared in the speeches of my predecessors, obviously. Firstly, cities will need to be innovative. They will need to develop new approaches to try to turn to the situation, uh, to the, this situation uh, to their advantage. This is already happening in many places. Empty offices building are being converted into housing stocks. New building projects are being launched at high speed, also meeting the needs of citizens who have been waiting for a home for several years. Providing access to the labor market will be crucial. Given the scale of unemployment in many cities, this will not be an easy task, but it is absolutely vital. In many cities, local authorities are already working together with business to match refugees' skills and qualifications to labor needs. Many refugees have had a professional career before leaving their homeland and are eager to contribute to their host country. We must find ways to benefit from their skills and talents, and it is our duty to remove any obstacles that might hold them back. Extraordinary investments will be needed in education. Schools are already opening their doors to hold classes, often at rather unusual hours, but this is only the start of a much bigger effort. And we were talking here about raising awareness and about taking care of ta talents. It is there where it all starts. Sharing best practice and innovative ideas in all these areas will be crucial, and the European Commission is ready to play its part in this. We will support new integration measures, both financially and through practical action. We have already developed an interactive map displaying local and regional authorities' good practices. This can be viewed on our Europa website. To come back to the conditions we need to meet, the second one I would like to highlight is about the solidarity among cities. Given the current scale of migration, we can all agree that the task of helping refugees integrate cannot be left to just a few cities. We can be stronger and more efficient, all of us, only if all cities will share responsibilities, look for the best solutions together, and show solidarity. In various countries of the European Union, networks of the cities have already been set up. They have already demonstrated their capacity to design tailor-made relocation systems. This means assigning refugees to the concrete socio-economic setting that best matches their needs and characteristics. Thirdly, there, needs to be a there need to be a response at different levels of governance. It was also mentioned before. National authorities and European Union institutions have a clear role in helping and supporting cities in achieving all variety of integration targets. 
Under these exceptional circumstances, national and local authorities need to talk to and understand each other better. They must define and share responsibilities to avoid surprises and pool resources together. And the Commission here again will take initiative helping to promote a freeware dialogue between local and national authorities and the level of the European Union. Sharing responsibilities also <coughs> implies that cities need the financial means to help refugees integrate. European Union funding is already available from the Asylum Migration and Integration Fund and European Social and Structural Funds. These are the com complementarity funds to help cities. The European Commission will make at least 600 million euros available in the next couple of years in order to support cities. And we will also be looking at how to step up this funding substantially. Fourthly and finally, I would like to stress the importance of the political leadership. It was also mentioned before. We all know that well-managed migration can improve lives of many. It brings both social and economic benefits to our societies. We should also consider what uh, we should also consider what migrants can do for the countries they have left behind. Yet at the same time, we should never forget that migration and refugees have always been emotive subjects and will remain so. So managing the current situation requires practical action. They will call for the operational support of all those involved and solidarity. We all know that such solidarity will inevitably run the risk of being undermined by populist leaders trying to take advantage of the current situation for their own political ends. We have even seen some mayors openly refusing to welcome people in need. We all know that such attitude can easily stir up emotions and create unhelpful polarization, making an already onerous task even more difficult. This is why the continued public support for our policies will be even more crucial. Only committed political leadership at local, national and European Union level can help to ensure full inclusion and social cohesion. Diversity comes with challenges. Diversity brings also opportunities. Our conference offers, offers an ideal opportunity to seek ways of tackling the situation and identify initiatives that will enable migrants and refugees to become confident and accepted members of the new community. This task will not be an easy one. However, by joining forces, we will get there. I remember that Ambassador Swing some days ago in the high-level conference on Eastern Mediterranean and Western Balkans uh, migratory flows, he said that migration is not so much a problem to be solved, but the human reality to be managed. So it is our real duty to get there. On behalf of our Commissioner, Dimitris Avramopoulos, my Director General and my colleagues, involved now in daily basis in the cause of migration, both professionally and personally. I, will, I wish all of us for these two days a very good discussion and exchange of practices in the spirit of ownership and partnership you mentioned before too. I'm confident that it will be the case. I would like to thank you very much for kind attention. Thank you. Let me also, in your behalf, thank all of our speakers here, uh, Madam Mayor, Madam Assistant Secretary General, Madam Director, for your remarks, which have enriched a lot our discussion already. Uh, I apologize, we're a little bit behind schedule because we started a bit late, but we'll catch up in the course of the two days. Don't worry about that. And I'm going to uh, ask my colleagues, and we will all now take our places in the, uh, in the audience here, and I will ask the next uh, panel uh, uh, to come forward. Uh, thank you very much.